Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tembani Matabata. My supervisor for the talk is Dr. Haynes van der Meven. We'll be talking about the burden of gender-based violence in South Africa. It's quite saddening, and the pandemic and the crisis at the present moment, also with COVID. Uh, as Dr. van der Meven mentioned that uh, during one of the family meetings early, early last year, President Ramaphosa once mentioned this. He said, it is with the heaviest of hearts that I stand before the women and girls of South Africa this evening to talk about another pandemic that is raging in our country, the killing of women and children by the men of our country. Just some flashback of the saddening stories that have happened and uh, loss of uh, beautiful women that have died in the hands of men. Uh, we all know about the story of Uinene, who uh, was a, a, a student at UCT, who went to pick up a parcel at Claremont Post Office, where she met uh, one of her uh, abusers. She was uh, raped, killed, put in a plastic bag, and then the body was kept overnight in the post office, and then the following day, the body was set alight and buried in a, in a backyard of a murder. That led uh, to, it brought the country to stand still. The point there was national marches and protesting against the, the, the gender based abuse. One of the other ladies in Durban, uh, Verusha, whom uh, was allegedly uh, killed by her husband, was found uh, with her hands bound with cable ties above her head. She had suffered severe trauma to her head and it was believed to have been strangled after being assaulted. Other say story was of a Tsehofaso who was eight months pregnant at the time of her untimely death. She was stabbed and hanged on a tree. Apparently, allegedly, the mastermind behind her that, uh, death is a, is a, is a boyfriend. Who's a, who's a married boyfriend. Her trial is still ongoing. Of recently in East London, last month, uh, Nosikelo was brutally murdered by her boyfriend, and the body was found dismembered in a suitcase in East, one of the streets of East London. And last but not least, uh, we all know back in 2013, in August, when we woke up to the news of uh, Miss River, whom was shot and killed in the bathroom by her ex-boyfriend, Mr. Oscar Pistorius. Apparently, he allegedly mistake, mistaken her for an intruder. Now, coming to the talk. So, this is the overview of my talk. With the background. Uh, intimate partner violence is a silent public health epidemic in, uh, in South Africa. It affects everyone of ages, all people, irrespective of your economic, educational, social, and, rural, and racial background. It is the second highest burden after HIV AIDS and is the highest reported femicide in the world. Since 2013, approximately more than 4,400 women have been murdered by their partners in South Africa. Survivors of IPV, they are at increased risk of a wide range of psychological and behavioral problems. They are also at, uh, ex they are more likely to have delayed entry into antenatal care by a ratio of 1.8 times. I also found that uh, during the COVID times, there's an alarming uh, increase in, in rape cases and assault cases related to IPV. With uh, between April and June this year, more 487 cases were reported and more than 15,000 cases of physical assault were, were also reported. In June alone, they reported at least 21 uh, ladies dying from IPV-related deaths. Uh, definition of IPV, 
is defined as attempted, threatened, or actual physical or mental abuse by a current or ex-intimate partner. The South African Domestic Act of Act 116 of 1998 define it as follows, physical abuse, sexual, emotional, verbal, psychological, economic abuse, intimidation, harassment, stalking, damage to property, entering into complainant's residence without consent, or any abusive behavior towards a complainant where such conduct harms or cause immediate harm to the safety and health of the complainant. The term uh, domestic violence is used in many countries to refer to intimate partner violence and in some settings is used to describe child abuse and neglect. Men are the common perpetrators. Although some cases they can be same sex relations or, L or men, women can be perpetrators also but there's less evidence showing the incidence of, of, of such. Sexual assault is defined as an act in which a person intentionally touches another person without their consent and or physically forces a person to engage in a sexual act against their will. Example as listed. Sexual cohesion is defined as a range of behaviors that a partner may use related uh, to sexual decision making to pressure or coerce a person to have sex without using physical force. For example, someone might threaten to, to end a relationship if someone doesn't want to have sex with them or forced non-condom use. And then femicide is, is defined as death of females resulting from any form of abuse caused by men. Continuing with the definitions, uh, reproductive coercion is, is defined as behaviors that interfere with contraception, use, and or pregnancy, such as threatening to end a relationship if the woman doesn't want to get pregnant or if she doesn't want to terminate pregnancy. Uh, control of pregnancy can also contribute to a situation in which women are less likely to prepare to have a child emotionally or financially. Such women have increased, once they fall pregnant, they have increased likelihood of having a miscarriage. Coming to incidents, uh, I'll touch with the national and then mention the global. Uh, it uh, accounts for 62% of inter total interpersonal violence on females in South Africa, with women being killed by their current or ex-partners at a rate of 8.8 per 100,000, 100, which is five times uh, more than the global average rate. In one of the studies that was done in South Africa of married and cohabitating uh, women, they found a prevalence of 31%. It is reported that 42% 42, 42 of females aged between 13 years and 23 reported ever experiencing physical dating violence in South Africa, and that 25% of women are assaulted every week by their partners. The global stats was uh, by WHO, which was a study on a multi-country uh, on health and domestic violence. It has had uh, the following incidences. I'll mention some, uh, whereby four to 49% of women reported experiencing severe physical violence by a partner, six to 59% being sexually violated by their partner in their life. And then one to 28% that were physical abuse during pregnancy were also by their partners. And that at 19 to 51% of women that were physical abused by their partner, they will leave their homes at least one at night. And then eight to 21 had mentioned that they left their homes two to three to five times at night. And then uh, women of uh, 15 to 49 years, uh, 13 to 61% of them report that they were physically abused by their partner at least once in their lifetime. So just to mention the few of the driving, drivers of uh, uh, gender-based violence, 
in terms of risk factors, uh, being uh, unresolved childhood conflicts, lower socioeconomic status, personality disorders such as antisocial personality, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, family and personal history of violence. Also to add that uh, gender norms and cultural norms as one of the main driving force of gender-based violence. Uh, this slide is just to show uh, that these factors, they come as multifactorial factors, meaning that they can be at a microsocial level, community level, male partner, at the relationship level, and then other being a woman. Just to mention few, at the microsocial level, you find that under gender order, there'll be, there's a lack of economic rights and entitlements, entitlements for women. And also under economical factors, women's access to formal wage employment. At a community level, there's the norms, such as especially in our cultural background, you find that there's acceptance of wife beating and tolerance of harsh physical punishment of children. And there's also high unemployment rate. Under male partner, uh, you find that some of the boys, they grew up witnessing their parents, uh, their mothers being violated by their fathers. Uh, that also leads to childhood trauma that end up they grow with. And then in their, when they are adults, they also practice the same. And they'll have antisocial behavior, they abuse alcohol, and then they, there's also low educational level. It is stated that if someone, they, they don't reach up to secondary level or high school, then they are more prone to, to commit uh, uh, gender-based violence. And then at a relationship level, because of poor communication, then partners, they tend to end up having violence and male drinking and failure to meet gender role expectations. And then childhood uh, violence, uh, ch child sexual abuse, and then the tolerance of wife beating also comes as part of articles under childhood violence. So those are the sum of the risk factors that I identify. But it's quite a lot as we can see. So that lead to, to this problem. So the cycle of, of violence, usually it goes as you'll find you have an incident where any form of abuse occurs, which will then lead to a makeup, we call it a making up phase, whereby the abuser may apologize for the abuse and may promise that it will never happen again. There, also in this making up phase, the abuser may deny that the abuse took place and say it was not bad as the victim will state it has happened. Also, then there will be a calm or honeymoon phase whereby the abuser will act as if the abuse has never happened, and also physical abuse might, has not happened in this stage. And then that will lead to tension building phase, whereby the, the abuser will get angry, and then there will be poor communication between the two couples, then leading to a phase of acting out, whereby then the actual physical violence or any other form of the abuse will be communicated committed to the, to, the, to, the, to the lady. So what do we do or what to look for when you're seeing uh, someone in your OPD? So usually these ladies, they come uh, with unrelated problems uh, with mild, soft, non-specific somatic or emotional complaints. So they come with migraines, back pain, uh, uh, EGIT symptoms uh, come frequently. So you need to pay attention to those. So when someone comes, the clues or the cues, you might find that they fail, they've got failure to make eye contact, they have an defensive posture, they are appearing anxious and fearful, and they are vague when they are responding and, they, and also they decline to give answers. Some of the clues will be they visit the EC frequently, 
and they will miss their appointments. And also you'll find that the partner is reluctant to leave the patient when you are in a consulting room. To a point, the partner will want to dominate the conversation because they don't want to, the, their female partner to, to expose or might say that they, they actually abuse them. So under gynecological or obstetric issues, uh, they might present, will like come with the STIs, chronic pelvic pain, they will have unwanted, unplanned pregnancies, and they will have poor lack of antenatal care, they will have miscarriages, they will come requesting termination of pregnancy, and teen pregnancies, and then antepartum hemorrhage. Under psychiatric, they will have a sleeping disorder, substance abuse, suicidal ideations, and eating disorders. So when you when you examining these ladies, so once you see that there's an injury without any proper explanation, particularly involving the head and neck, the teeth, the genital area, you should be concerned. They usually sustain their injury on the central part of the body, such as the breast, abdomen, genitals, because they're usually physically assaulted. And when you see neck bruising, you should think of probably they were strangulated and wounds on the forearms are usually suggestive that they're being attacked in a defensive mode. So what are the consequences of, uh, of, of uh, IPV? So I group them into gynecological. Some I've mentioned already in the previous, in the clinical presentation. Some will be uh, PID, recurrent UTIs, they also increase of CA cervix, they'll have infertility, and then under obstetrics, you might have unintended pregnancies, miscarriages, as I mentioned earlier, preterm labor, low birth weight, substance abuse, uh, placental abruptions, stillbirth and neonatal death, and death in pregnancy, and postpartum depression. Under mental, they will have uh, post poor self-esteem, PTSD, unsafe sexual behaviors, and they will have physical injuries, such as uh, abdominal or thoracic or fractures and hearing impairment, and uh, chronic pain syndromes and irritable bowel syndrome. They will also lead to homicide, which state that 40 to 70% of female murders, murder victims are like are killed by their husband or boyfriend. This also has an impact on children to a point that you, they, all, they have poor uh, school performances, they're most likely to uh, miss their immunizations and then they might have anxieties and uh, also depression. So things to do during a consultation when you're seeing someone whom you suspect or has clues for IPV. So things to do, you must establish trust, assure that the patient, you believe what the patient is telling you. You must do a relevant clinical assessment and inform the patient that abuse is unacceptable. Do a risk assessment and create a, classes, a crisis plan, which I'll talk about them later, and properly document in detail and provide information on posters and pamphlets, which I'll also share, and then refer to appropriate medical, psychological, social, and legal for assistance. What not to do during a consultation? Please don't impose your own judgments on the patient. Don't ignore or invalidate the patient's complaints or instruct the patient to leave a partner because it has been shown that it can, that can also lead to grievously body harm to patient or serious harm to the patient and up losing their lives. So you need to have a proper crisis plan. Continuing with the consultation, you should uh, assure the patient of confidentiality uh, in a private setting for consultation. So these are some of the examples of how you ask questions about when you're screening for IPV. So example being, uh, are you in a relationship? Are you happy? Is everything all right at home? Has your partner ever threatened or forced to do something that you didn't want to do? Have you ever felt afraid of your partner? 
does your partner try to control you? So once she, she answers most likely two out of three out of these five questions that I've listed here, then you should be concerned about there, about IPV. Also, you must note that the patient, they've got a right to refuse to answer despite given adequate opportunity to disclose any form of abuse. So we should respect them. So what can we do to prevent IPV? These are some of the pointers that I came across and that I thought they are valuable. We can engage men and boys to promote non-violence and gender equality, starting at the community level, also at a social level. That means that it will need everyone to stand up, not necessarily just the government or certain stakeholders. From health, lawyers, social workers, community also must also help. So there must be campaigns that are going to help the boys so that they can be taught on how to, to promote nonviolence. Uh, also, we can organize media and advocacy campaigns to raise awareness about the existing legislation. We can strengthen women's civil rights related to divorce, property, child support. We can challenge the uh, cultural norms and practice, practices that usually perpetuate to gender inequalities. And also can promote social and economic empowerment of women and girls. So how do we diagnose uh, IPV? Or what helps in, to diagnose IPV? So it is very important to take a full history. I mean, when you see a patient for your first visit and also routine screening, asking about IPV, it increases its detection. ACOG, they actually suggest that every lady who comes on an initial visit in your antenatal clinic you should, should be screened for IPV. Some of the useful acronym, uh, which is called SAFE questions, are useful for screening. Uh, where S will stand for stress or safety. So you will ask the lady, do you feel safe in your relationship? A, are you afraid, abused? Have you ever been in a relationship where you were threatened, hurt, or afraid? And then F will be friends or family. Are your friends or family aware that you have been hurt? And you also you can ask if then they, they know, will they be willing to support you? And then must E is for emergency plan. Then you ask about a place, a, a place of, a safe place to go and resources you need in case there's in case of emergency. Some of the strategies that have been developed internationally and locally. The, this uh, respect framework strategy was developed by WHO and UN for Women. Just to just touch base what they actually said, uh, whereby they said the relationship skills should be, should be strengthened, whereby meaning that the communication and interpersonal communication should be strengthened and then the empowerment of women should also, and then as services ensured, meaning that the health, legal, social services, they must attend to victims of IPV. They must re poverty reduce, environments made safe, child and adolescent abuse prevented, T, transform attitude, beliefs and norms. And then one of the South African strategies, the National Strategy Plan on GBVF, uh, which was implemented, is actually starting in 2019. It's still an ongoing process. Uh, they've set targets for five years and also for the 10-year outcome with the plan that in 2020, 2030, they're saying that the South Africa must be violent free. So some of the pillars that they mentioned on, 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 on the key strategies was accountability, coordination, leadership, prevention and rebuilding social cohesion, justice, safety and protection, 
response, care, support, healing, economic power, research and information. The, as you see, the picture on the right is the, that's the actual document, the 135 pages that entails and talks about the, the actual planning and also what their outcomes and their targets. So how do we manage when you see someone with the IPV in your OPD or EC? So you treat any serious injuries as emergency. Once a patient is, uh, is disclosed uh, abuse, you must impress, express some empathy and acknowledgement and offer continued support and assistance. Uh, some of the, the when you, in a nutshell, they, they've developed like six hours for management, for managing a patient with IPV, where first R, you must realize that abuse is happening. You must recognize and acknowledge the patient's concerns. You must do relevant clean color assessment, you must do risk assessment, crisis plan, and then refer to appropriate, uh, to appropriate department. So clean color assessment should be guided by what the patient presents to you and we give appropriate intervention based on what she, she was complaining for. So on, when you're conducting risk assessment, you ask such questions. Uh, does the woman fear for her life? Is she being threatened with serious harm? Are the children involved? Is the abuse escalating? Is the weapon involved? Does the partner abuse substances? If, for example, then there's a weapon involved, then you know that the, that the particular individual is at serious risk for harm. Though then you will, you will escalate and involve, probably find a shelter or admit to a facility in hospital that uh, deals with such issues, and then refer to social worker and involve lawyers if she wants to involve them. And then, the importance of documentation is very vital. You must always specify the nature of the abuse, the name of the abuser, the nature of their relationship. Do that risk assessment should be documented all the time. And you must describe the physical injuries and measure and illustrate with diagrams. This documentation will help you in situations such as when you want to procure a, a protection order and also opening a successful case etc. So a crisis plan should be made if the patient was willing to leave a partner. So it entails uh, that the, 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 the victim must be prepared, must prepare herself actually to, to, to leave the partner by identifying a place where she can use a telephone, put man away for, say, for transport in an emergency, have extra keys and for the house, pack clothes, ensure that they have essential documents such as ID, birth certificates for kids, and then ensure someone trustworthy that has five copies of protection orders, warrants for arrest, and other legal documents. Once so that when she escapes, then she can use such documents to, to, to issue so that the, the abuser cannot get hold or access into her. I've mentioned already that they should be referred to mental care unit and social services. You can also offer legal information if the patient is, is desiring such. Uh, we must also take into note uh, that there's a protection order which is obtained from the magistrate's court, which is designed as a behavior modification to protect against uh, victims of IPV. It's available even after hours and doesn't expire. Other option will do to lay a charge usually at a police station. Uh, and then in case of physical violence, J88 must always be completed by the attending doctor. And in the case of sexual violence, a rape kit must always be properly uh, filled in and everything documented accordingly. 
So some of the questions I ask myself, why don't women report such? So I found that there's usually lack of human rights awareness about IPV, the normalization of abuse. They tend not to frame their experience as abuse. They've got pure faith in the legal system. Abusers often intimidate into not reporting. The, the abusers may threaten to harm or leave kids. And there's a stigma of losing custody of children associated with divorce. And why women don't leave their partners? It has been noted that many South African women are economically disempowered. So they rely on their partners for financial support. And the victims have got low self-esteem to a point that they've, once they've got a partner, they feel fortunate that they will never cope without that particular partner, even though they, 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 they're victimizing them. They also have a feeling of unworthy of finding other partners and the love of the partner and hope that the partner will eventually change, which in most cases is not the case. So in summary, all IPV patients should be assessed for safety. A close follow-up is very important, especially if you pick up that in a crisis plan, the patient is in serious harm, it should be designed. If any significant risk factor is, is present, it is important to devise a safety plan. Offer counseling to strengthen the victim's sense of self-worth. Documentation is very important if the patient in future sees legal redress. We as health care workers, we should receive training to identify and handle such cases appropriately. And then information campaigns should be developed for members of the public to assist in recognizing signs of abuse with their familial and social circles. These are some of the very important uh, contact details uh, available in South Africa. Uh, the outgoing uh, executive director, Pumzile Blambo, uh, said to truly end violence against women and girls, we need to dismantle the foundations of gender inequality and discrimination. That means attaining real and lasting equality between girls, boys, and women, and men in all areas of their lives. It also means sustaining the women's rights movement that has long been at the forefront action on gender equality. We also need to transform discriminatory attitudes, beliefs, and social norms and promote the human rights of all women and girls with the respect for diversity, gender equality, and nonviolence. We must end GBV now. I thank you.
um, where we expose many pre-existing diseases and issues and we sort of pr pride ourselves that we are now the place where all of this is picked up because it's um, a place where all women go when they're pregnant but I don't think we always include this as part of that for all the logistical reasons and we should maybe rethink that a little bit that it can also be a place where these things can be picked up and exposed the second thing is that I've got a friend that lives in a small town in Canada and I always think of these first world countries as protected from these kinds of problems and she spoke to me and said <coughs> that one of the biggest uh, problems is gender-based violence and they've got in their little town they've got quite a large safety house with multiple women staying there sort of um, hiding away from partners and things like that and I also met a lady actually last week who runs a safety house in Stellenbosch I've, I've never really thought about it I must say about these places but she spoke to me about the challenges of running a place like that because these women are hiding from partners and they have to bring people in, for instance, to cut their hair. They have to um, take it. If they can't go to the shops and, you know, if they want to learn to drive to empower them, they have to do it every time in a different vehicle. They can't be recognized. So it is really a challenge to, I think, protect these women and then bring them back into the community. Um, because as Tara said for them, the most, one of the most dangerous moments for them is actually to, to get away from the part at that moment and then where they're going to stay then and to protect them then a very um, difficult you know cha challenge you can imagine um, yeah I think that's all the things I was thinking of while you were speaking thank you yeah thank you maybe just a comment for me about your talk as well I think you've done an exceptionally good job um, to bring together something to um, draw our attention to the scope of the problem but also to make some sense of it because it's a very very complex and difficult topic um, to talk about um, men and women live in different countries in South Africa um, I can go out and walk from my house to the shop um, without being um, sort of let's call it aggressed upon in some sort of way um, while well, my daughter can't do it and my wife can't do it um, and it's it's an it's an issue that is um, a spectrum of microaggressions on a daily constant basis all the way to femicide and until we start talking about what is happening in our society and the inequality between genders we're not going to make a difference. Um, it's uh, gender-based violence and intimate partner violence is um, is just the end of a of a spectrum of in inequality. Um, and men and boys must start checking up on peer actions. We we need to create our own rule book about how we're going to interact with each other. Um, and I know this is almost overwhelming thought, but. Um, by doing sort of after the act doing um, care of the survivors we're not actually addressing the root cause of the problem um, and I, I wish that we can use situations like or places like universities to have these types of discussions um, about how do we give everybody an equal space um, to live their lives in in peace and harmony <coughs> I don't want to be too depressing. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Hans. Um, <coughs> Tira, I also want to say thank you for your talk. Um, I don't think it would be easy to stand up there and do what you did. It was it's a very sobering topic. Um, two other observations. One is um, for us as, as teachers. When I was examining at UCT one year, undergraduate, um, a similar topic came up actually in an OSCE in, in OSCE type meeting not OSCE, OSCE and um, I was amazed how well drilled those undergraduate UCT students were um, particularly the E of your acronym SAFE which you expanded upon in one of your other slides subsequent to that of having that case packed 
knowing where to go and protecting your vital documents because uh, vital documents are often used as manipulation and if you can get her vital documents away then you've got power so I was very impressed I don't know Haynes in the undergraduate program um, how where that is you would know better than me um, and then lastly I was listening to a program where, where somebody was saying to me and I can't comment on this as much as you perhaps can and other people here that it's a cultural thing um, and that there are some of our indigenous cultures where white beating is, is a sign of affection or you feel you're valued by your partner if that happens but having studied Ubuntu um, in, in um, philosophy and the, the, the concept of, of we are all responsible for each other collectively responsible so if something's happening in my house that's not good, you're responsible for it as well and looking after my wife or my daughter. Uh, it seemed to contradict that cultural value which I, s I think has been pulled out of perspective. But we've also lost the sense of Ubuntu, I am because we are. Uh, and I think that would be part of getting that together again. in our curriculum that deals with it, undergrad. There's a lot of work being done to include a lot more formal teaching in the, um, an explicit teaching about gender identity and about um, all aspects of gender-based violence in, in the new curriculum. In the current curriculum, it's under underrepresented. Um, and it focuses mostly on sort of the pathological side of yeah, we will never be able to pick up SP, this kind of thing, in a high-risk clinic that has 130 patients for the number of doctors we've got. It's, it's just wishful thinking. Um, I'm sure the right, the right victim is not coming to us, but I've never seen any of them relating to us. But I'm sure if we go out, we can get some sort of a more stable situation where we will take down to those rates. Um, and I think the last time that I reviewed the rape kit was when I was studying in Nubia. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's just, um, we can just have like a shoulder on heart, the rape kit that might be um, collected. Uh, no, we, we, we used to do that, but, but the rape victims don't, don't come to us anymore. I think they're... Uh, to 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 Carl Bremer, to to Carl Bremer. Yeah. And I think we can get some of their clinicians maybe to come and speak. So in the, in the new curriculum, there's a con complete module called positive sexology, with the idea that um, um, sexual functioning and sort of gender identity and all these things will be addressed in a positive way and introduced from early on in the curriculum. We got a massive donation from um, a Dutch uh, individual, um, and she's also very involved in um, in, in designing the curriculum. We get an expert in November. I will still, if, as soon as I have the date available, uh, Prof Professor Ross is coming to visit us to, to also help in, in designing the, that part of the curriculum and I will ask him to come and speak here on a, on a Friday afternoon. Um, but there are certainly um, very explicit um, um, new um, interventions in the, in the curriculum that will start next year. This week we had an ethno calls for the, the province and I um, had to, to facilitate a module that I don't usually do, the respect for care in pregnancy. It's usually done by Deirdre, but she was on leave. But she, um, it, it also falls in some parts into this, uh, these sort of same concepts of a power role over women who are vulnerable. So the way we treat women in pregnancy and when they present and 
everything that we do from, from uh, how, we, how we treat the patient, how we take consent, how we protect their privacy when we examine a patient, explain to them what's going on, in some ways can be, be linked to, you know, it's not necessarily violence, but it is having respect for that patient's autonomy and um, their privacy. And it's the, that um, presentation, the module is also on the, on the website, under the ESMO modules, the video that, that Deirdre has narrated. And it's really something that um, I think is, is useful to, to watch and just to think about when, when we if, um, you know, treat our own patients how we treat them. Just on that, the issue of respect to care is being really pushed by figure at the moment mm. as well, worldwide. So. Yeah, respect for human dignity. Yes. More than autonomy, dignity. And even as respect for time, there's lots of things in our system that obviously is not really respectful, uh, but it's, it's system problems that we don't always have control over, but it does, it does make you think we need a lot to do. overseas called Ring the Bell. Is it? Mm. So, so when, you, when you hear your neighbor knocking his wife around and you're not quite sure, then you go next door and you ring the bell. That's all you do. And say somebody's listening. Because um, you often really, you feel, you know, and we're talking outside our own comfort zones here or our own areas of expertise in medical medical areas, right? Uh, Billy, schakel gauw af, die nie koek vanaf. 